excited and happy about ag. Uh, we're we're kind of in a revival mode since since I became chair. The committee at one point was probably 20 strong. There was a lot of uh, support for it, and then it, it went through kind of a a disruption and people parted ways. And so we're we're trying to get back to that aspect of the committee where we're educating and also we get a little bit of, of revival in terms of energy. I think there were some folks on the committee that were fairly burnt out. Uh, there was some disagreements, but uh, the committee itself is, is very similar to the committee that's in Lancaster, except for we're about a tenth of the size. Uh, and I was on that committee down there for a number of years, so, so I brought some of that knowledge here to Lebanon when I, when I came back to Lebanon. I actually started my career in Lebanon in the late 80s, working with USDA, which was down in, in Cleona, uh, across from the old Fulton Bank, and then went down to Lancaster County and was there for about 20 years. And then when Sean McKinney left Fulton to go to Ephrata, as all good ag lenders do, uh, we got to hurry up and fill the, the void. And because I live in Robazonia, uh, Fulton came to me and said, we need an ag lender quickly in Lebanon. And within two days, I was, of course, here. I retired from USDA and, and came here. So I've been here about five years. Uh, Randy, Randy Eversall was kind enough to, to talk to the, the regional president of the bank, Barry, and get me on the committee right away because he, he had heard that I was on the committee down in Lancaster. And when I came to this committee, I was, I was actually surprised uh, with the amount of things we do. So with that, uh, we started, one thing we do is we start the year out with breakfast at the fair. And breakfast at the fair kind of evolved over the last three or four years where we found a need to do some education to both the farming public as well as the, the non-farming public that's seeking knowledge because we want to make sure, as you may or may not know, there's a lot of misconceptions about ag. And, and I always like to give the example that when people drive by a dairy farm and they see those white huts, they like to tell their neighbors that, you know, everyone's an expert when they live out in the country, so those are veal hutches and that's where veal calves are raised. So we try to educate as, as much as we can, and there's no better place to educate than over breakfast. So Penag has, has these cookers with pans, and they're nice enough to lend them to us. So what, what we do is we invite folks to the fair. This year we were fortunate enough to have Red Barn uh, Consulting, which is an ag consulting group that helps with permitting. The, the hot point right now is permitting an ag. We're seeing anywhere from twenty to fifty thousand dollars in permit fees and engineering fees just to get a confinement building built. So we thought it was fairly timely to get Peter out. So Peter came out. We served about ninety, Susie. Mm -hmm. About ninety people came through in forty minutes. Uh, we made omelets at an omelet station, serve them, and then had Peter talk about permitting, why you need a consultant, what all the fees are for, and it was, it was fairly well accepted by the folks that were there. We, we always get a crowd that is probably less production oriented than we want them to be at this event, but it's really turned out to be a super event. I mean, Kurt, you can see there, Curtis flipping omelets in the, in the lower, and people are just absolutely amazed that we can make that many omelets that quick. So we then, we then move on throughout the summer. The hope is to get the exchange candidates together, and, and the farm city exchange candidates are typically a business person and a farm person. We try to go every other year with a female farmer one year, and, and a a male farmer the, the next. Last year we had we had uh, an attorney change places with with a poultry farmer and, and that worked out fairly well. And then this year we have which way? <laughs> um both ways. Okay. 
because actually we got a we got a farmer to write a will and do some estate planning that probably wouldn't have got done if it at least is timely if we didn't have an attorney in the swap and this year we have karen grow is swapping with miranda sellers miranda is a a dairy farm wife that's very involved with with the farm and uh, they're going to exchange and then a part of that we do we do an elementary tour and we take an inner city school and we bring them out to a farm and and spend the better half of the morning into lunch educating which is our primary goal them on ag and what's really neat about that is we get these inner city kids coming in and they're a nightmare and I shouldn't say that but they are uh, they come in and they come off the bus and I think they're ready to just run wild and thankfully we have enough help that we put them in groups of eight or ten run them around to different places on the farm educate them about all the different aspects of the farm and they bring their parents oftentimes as chaperones and I think we educate the parents oftentimes more than the kids and it's really to me it's the part of of the whole farm city committee that I probably like the most because you're taking these people that know absolutely nothing about ag and you're you're educating them on what Lebanon County actually has and why they should promote local ag and what exactly they're seeing when they drive around so we do that this year it'll be on Friday the uh, the 16th we'll be at John Klein's farm on South Ramona Road uh, John was gracious enough to open up his farm that's one of our challenges I mean to get to get a farm family to open up their farm not only to bring kids on a Friday but to bring have an open tour on Saturday and the open tour basically is an open tour so people come they walk through the farm it's, it's typically self-guided uh, this year we made the decision that John's farm is just a little too tight in proximity with all the buildings so we're going to actually have tour guides that bring groups of 15 or so around the farm so that we can do a little bit more one-on-one -on -one with them and just help to educate them a little bit more so uh, that that's the so we do the breakfast at the fair we start that out in the spring we then move in to uh, early fall and do the elementary farm tour and then the following day we do the open farm tour last year it was at Patches Creamery and one of the things that's amazing about this county and, and I noticed that I lived in Chester County for a while and people down there just vomit money everywhere and came to Lebanon County and Lebanon County people are very very tight to the best with everything they do so we have this open farm tour at Patches Creamery and you would think that people would just see this creamery where there's fresh ice cream and milk and there's this huge subdivision right across the street and we thought wow people must just come here and buy their milk and they don't so they have a very hard time getting people to come down the lane and buy their product so one of our goals as in terms of educating was not only to educate the public but to show them that there's actually a, a creamery across the road and to try to help this business get a little bit more business. So then we, we finish up the year with the Farm City Banquet. Uh, I don't know if it's good or bad. I'm going to say, sadly, we've, we've lost the opportunity to use Church of the Midway, Midway Church of the Brethren, for our banquet. Uh, they did not tell us until we actually called to reserve the date and the the reason they gave us was that they pretty much uh, the the help that they had within the church was inadequate and that they were only going to do to do church related catering which was that made our our banquet very easy to run when we had them because they provided all the staff to to clean up and to serve food and of course they put on a big feed bag for us so uh, the farm city banquet then will morph back to where it started which was the Ag Expo the problem 
with the Ag Expo and in our mind is that we have a committee of six, maybe seven active members. We should have 20 and we now have to put on a 300 plus person banquet at the Expo Center in a big open room and we've got to somehow give it that charm that we had over at the church. So this is a, a huge year for us to do that with a skeleton crew. We're hoping to fill the expo with a ton more tractors and exhibits than just ag and try to get a good crowd there uh, just to catapult us up to really where we ought to be. I mean, we ought to be able to get four or 500 people to come to the Farm City Banquet and we're hoping to be able to get back up there in a couple years. So uh, that's pretty much, and then at, at that, of course, you probably recognize that young budding attorney at the bottom. Uh, those were our, our exchange students last year. I don't know that Buzzkin Davis, that law firm, is fairly familiar in this room. So. Uh, but yeah, he was able to drive a combine and they had a pretty good time. They actually formed a, a friendship of sorts when they did the exchange, so that was really good for... And, and I appreciate Susie putting putting the PowerPoint together. That was I'm, Jess. I can't take credit for that. Oh, Jess did. Right. I'm sorry. I mean, I'll take credit Cha for it. Chamber folks. <laughs> so you're going to take the pictures for the exchange? Yes. Mm -hmm. And help us out there. I mean, and that's the thing. Without, without the help of the chamber, and I think that's where where there was issues over time, the Farm City Committee has historically netted some income for the chamber. And the old <coughs> members of the committee looked at that and said, it doesn't work for us to be making money for the chamber. We need to take that money and give it back to the community in the form of a scholarship or in the form of whatever. So we did then form a farm city scholarship and, and we give it used to be 500 now we give a thousand dollar scholarship to a, a FFA Lebanon County FFA or a VOAG student that's enrolling in at an ag college so we, we do help with that and we still we have a, a fairly I think last year we didn't quite get the numbers but uh, it's north of 7,000, I think, that nets back to, to the chamber uh, from, from everything we do. We try to get a lot of things donated. A lot of us on the committee uh, use our, our employment or our, our contacts to get donations to kind of to help out. But in terms of our official vision of this committee, We'll contribute to the prosperity of Lebanon Valley by educating our community with one of our area's largest industries, which is ag. And we'll serve to proactively advocate the Chamber's membership through sponsorship, door prizes, volunteer opportunities. So that, I think, it was, it was ironic because that was the rub down in Lancaster County and they actually, the ag, they called it down there, the Ag Chamber Committee, actually broke away from the Ag Chamber. And that's what they tried to do here, and it just didn't work. So the Farm City Committee is still alive and well in, in the actual chamber. We recognize, and especially I do as, as the chairman of this committee, we need the chamber because the clerical end, the organizational end, and, and just the contact end, I mean, we cannot do it as just a standalone. We do not have full-time employees and that's why we do lean on the chamber to help us through that because we recognize that that this is the chamber's committee uh, the other thing we're doing this year in Harrisburg there's a center of dairy excellence and that's a state funded and and also I think donation funded organization that just promotes dairy and since there's such I mean Lebanon County there was a survey a number of years back and Lebanon County is the number one county in all of the U.S. in terms of dairy farming, in terms of everything that the best place to dairy farm in, in the U.S. is Lebanon County, Pennsylvania. 
terms of soil types, uh, proximity to, to everything, and milk markets, uh, the whole works, parts stores. Um, so it's a great county to have ag in. So we have the Center of Dairy Excellence is actually going to come down as well as the Dairy Princesses. They're all part of our educational aspect of the tour. So we do lean on a number of people to help us with our endeavors, but uh, certainly we would love the committee to be bigger uh, in terms of, and, and I think we were fortunate enough to get Farm Bureau on board, not because of anything more than we kind of pushed to figure out a way to get more people on the committee that one of the requirements is you have to be a member of the chamber. Well, that's hard for a, a family farm or a small business that isn't a member of the chamber to ask us, okay, we go to them and say, do you want to be on the Ag Chamber Committee or the Farm City Committee? No, I'm not a member. I can't afford to be a member. So what we've done is we've, we've kind of looked at the Cargills of the world and the, the other banks of the world and the Farm Bureau is a member of the chamber. So by doing that, we can access their employee base and, and that's the reason we get, we're able to get Curtis here. Uh, and Curtis has been a great help. I mean, the, the breakfast at the fair and, and the farm tours, because he's semi-retired and he has the knowledge of ag, he can educate. Uh, does, a, does a super job at that. So Darren Miller is an, a lender with farm credit. He is slated to be the chairman next year. What typically happens is we get kind of a assistant or a vice chair, and then the, the chairman stays on for a couple years and then rolls off and then the vice chair comes, comes on board. So that's, that's pretty much it, the nuts and bolts of our committee. I don't know if you guys have any I'm questions. I'm not going to statistics in here, but and I've probably heard it somewhere along the line, but the percentage of land in the county that's used for agricultural purposes versus non-agricultural, or how many farmers, active farmers, either dairy or otherwise. Yeah, I, I do not, I know that that's certainly available, but I, I do not know for Lebanon County itself. And when you distinguish dairy farmers, you're distinguishing them from non-dairy farmers. Right, so there's a, there's a, when you do the census, there's something that's called a NAX code. It's a national, I don't know, it's a, it's a category. And when you file your taxes, you actually use it. So there's poultry, there's dairy, there's crop farmers, there's beef farmers. And, and it's, it's, it's a way the government codes things so that if there's a disaster, they have they have an idea of what what's out there. For instance, poultry. If we get the avian flu, they want to know who the who the poultry farmers are in a certain area. So that stuff is available. I know with our portfolio, our which is a pretty plan. good. I'm sorry. It's in the comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. I did a presentation up at the economic forecast breakfast, and it's like 120,000 acres of cropland. Uh, I think there's, you know, dairy farmers over that are have more than like 10 cows or something is like 560. Uh, the total, it, it, it's it's almost half of the total land in Lebanon County is is being farmed. How many members of the chamber are from the farm community? When we go down through that list, you probably count them on two hands. No, one hand. You know, the Farm Bureau now has brought farmers, if they're a Farm Bureau member, then now they're also by extension a chamber member. So we, we've been able to leverage that a little bit, but actual farm operations that have chamber memberships, it's only... Well, more of them are business slash farm. Right. But I mean, like the winders are clearly a farm, but right. significant business too. Um, is is that partly because we have someone Mennonite and, and Amish 
farmers and, and they won't join an organization like this? That's absolutely right. And we have trouble getting them to join Farm Bureau because they don't want to be affiliated with that. When Farm Bureau filed suit against the EPA a couple of years ago, there was a certain number of them so they can no longer be members because they didn't want to be involved in lawsuits. And so it, 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 it's, it's walking on thin ice with some of that membership. I've been in some extended conversations trying to convince convince them. They, they know the benefits. I mean, Farm Bureau can go out there and, and say, you know, we were active in helping uh, get clean and green being an option back in the 80s, and then the reassessment came through last year, or yeah, three years ago now, and people saw the difference, the farmers saw the difference in what their tax bill would be without clean and green, you know, it, it, it should have had a flood of doors open up say, oh yeah, we want to support Farm Bureau membership now, but they say thanks, but no, I don't want to be a member. <laughs> and the other, other thing with getting farmers on the committee, a lot of the small, medium farmers, the operators are wearing so many hats already, and to pry time away to come to other meetings and to do something else, it is so difficult. Uh, I just wondered uh, if there was any thought to inviting the Ag Extension and the Conservation District to be part of the committee. I'm actually on the Extension's or the the uh, yeah. Conservation District's board, and I and I have said to them a couple times. Now they do help. When we do the Farm City Tour, they come out and they run an act. Both, both Extension and, and the district run one of the educational booths there because they can get away with putting it under their education slot. So they have to have so many hours of education for the grant reimbursement thing. So they get it done that way. But in terms of getting them away and, and actually getting them involved in a committee, I'm not so sure that they they can get ju it justified enough to to come on board because we continually ask and we just don't get real far. Are they is are they I mean I don't know verbal asks or are they formal written asks? Verbal. Yeah. Oh, it would be great if we could. I mean. It, it's ironic to me because in, in Lancaster County, of course, it's a it's a much bigger beast. But there's probably 25 people on the committee, and there's three attorneys and three accountants and three bankers, and and everything rolls. You can only be on so long, and then you've got to be off. And people don't want to get off the committee, and then they wait. They have to be off for a year, and then they get back on because. Family farm days at Oregon Dairy, 15,000 people come through. And, you know, when you talk about educating ag, 15,000 people coming through a three day event with five wagons going, taking people around the farm. I mean, it's just it's 250 volunteers. It's a huge event. And that's why I've said, you know, for us to get even a small event going in this county, we just, we have a very a very tight group that does it. They don't want to. They don't want to go in this county and put themselves out there very far. Hmm. So we have the Elco FFA helping with our farm tour this year, and on the open tour date, my son is involved with with the uh, FFA over in Berks County at Conrad Weiser. And they're going to bring a couple of their officers over just to help make sure that we have enough hands because they don't have anything over there like that and of course those kids want to get out there as well so can I ask another a, a question that it's not on the organization but just questions because I as I recall Curtis when you, you gave your presentation last year you mentioned about the effect in Lebanon County on the poultry regulations in California. And I'm, I was stunned when you said that, that they reached that far across the country. Can you 
elaborate on that? The, the, the gist of it was there was a referendum on a California ballot in 08, I believe it was. You know, should chickens have more room to stretch their wings out? I don't know exactly what the wording was. Like, oh, that feels good, you know, and so they check yes. And then the ripple effect, once it became enforced, because, you know, and one of the things it was like seven years out until it was going to be enacted, it was so difficult to have so many different types of eggs on the market. Eggs is basically a commodity. It's one egg equals another egg. But now you have eggs that came from cages with, you know, 7.5 square feet or 15 square feet or whatever. It, and, and no one can tell the difference between the egg, but it has to be kept in separate channels, and that became so difficult. So rather than have the different channels, they just put pressure on through the system to oblige to the California standard, and that's, what, that's how it affected Lebanon County. And there was a, a poultry farmer Palmyra had two big layer houses, and he had a one of them had a major fire this summer, and you know killed like fifty thousand chickens. But there were about six or eight thousand that lived in the one end, so we were carrying them and putting them in the other house. But his his egg handler was so concerned that they didn't have that they have a permit that he could, they could put one extra hen in each cage. They had taken two heads out of each cage to go from an 80,000 house to a 56,000 house so that you meet the standard. So we, we put these six or 7,000 chickens back over. The, the, his, his receiver uh, was so concerned that they could get a waiver that they could handle these eggs. You know, he didn't want to get caught with eggs that weren't certified. UEP. It, it, it is, it, it, it's just insane. It, People that are close to it know there is the, the, the chickens are very productive, and, and the whole idea that a, the most productive animal is a content, peaceful animal. You don't beat production out of them by stressing them and putting them under. You know, the, the farmer's going to take good care of the animals, and that 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 seems like a very simple argument to me to make, but people just. Transpose human feelings, you know, if I was that tight that my wings would hit Joel and I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be happy. You know? I wouldn't be happy. Well, okay, well, <laughs> that's it. They're putting human standards on, on, on to animals or it, 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 it's just absurd for the people that work with the animals in the poultry. I'm not sure if that answered your question, but that was... So so what what is happening is, is that just because you can't, you can't possibly uh, comply with multiple regulations, uh, you sort of, uh, everybody complies with the one that is is the most uh, stringent. It, is, in is fact, that's how yeah. it comes down to all, all across the country. Right, right. And of course that, that I assume raises the price of eggs because... Oh yeah. It, it had that and then we had the avian flu this year. I mean the price of eggs is roughly double what it was a little about a year ago. Yeah, and our loving guys are loving life. Yeah, the, 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 some of the producers that haven't had avian flu, especially ones that haven't down, you know, haven't thinned their cages out, most of them have. They, they had to be very, very profitable because the cost of feed is relatively low compared to two years ago. So they, they aren't complaining in that regard, but the difficulty of making everybody happy is kind of so. so uh, do, do you have any idea whether, whether I guess I can answer this as well as you maybe, but whether the public has any idea how these kinds of regulations increase prices and provide, at least as far as I can tell, no, no benefit? No, I don't think they do. And it, it's difficult for politicians or people in the public to get out there and say, Look, this is stupid because then if you're on the side of tormenting and torturing animals, you might as well be thrown into the garbage heap. You know, you, you, no one wants to be on the opposite side of loving our animals. It's just so difficult to come with a practical, reasoned argument against you know loving your the, your your animal 
you know, animals are like my cat and dog and kids in some cases, you know. They, they were so <laughs> nice because they were brown eggs. Oh. And I was just like, wow. He said, look at these things. These cage-free eggs, the shells are harder, the color's better, because they go outside and they, and, and I said, wow. <laughs> and he said, I will never buy a, a caged egg again. And I, and I was absolutely amazed because we have 10 chickens at home and our chickens actually run around the farm. And when we crack an egg from our chickens, the yolk is yellow, yellow, and it stands way up with the albumin. And you take a caged free egg and crack it next to it, and then take a caged egg and crack it next to it, and they're kind of washed out, real loose, you know, because they're production eggs. They're not, you know, we're not getting many eggs from our chickens, but what eggs we get are clearly different mm -hmm. but yeah so that so with this whole cage thing we started at nine chickens per cage and then when McDonald's and Hardee's and all these folks got on board we went down to 6.7 birds per cage which in essence just takes the square footage of the cages and so you can't put a point bird in a cage so you end up putting different numbers in the cages anyway so they went to that standard. Well, what happened was, effectively, the price of eggs went up in California, and then the people there started importing their eggs from this next state over. So it hurt their own people by thinking happy chickens. Well, then what that did to Lebanon County was the heritage poultries of the world and, and some of the other egg producers then got contracts for cage-free eggs and we're able to then go to the producers in Lebanon County and say, if you build a cage-free house, we'll give you a pretty substantial contract. So what, what's happening is we're, we've got some poultry expansion going on in Lebanon County because of the California laws. And it's coming across the nation. And so we used to have 125,000 birds in a 500-foot house. Now in a 500-foot house, we have 20,000 birds, cage-free. So it takes five of those $650,000 chicken houses to have the same production level as we had with one cage house. There's not enough land in the U.S. to have all cage-free houses to produce the number of eggs that the consumer wants. So that's the interesting part of this whole thing. And it used to be that if you had a chicken house on Joe Blow's farm here, the chicken integrator would say, if, you, if the neighbor asked to put a chicken house up, that integrator would say, no dice. Biosecurity-wise, we don't want those chicken houses near each other. Now, of course, because of the demand, because of the need for producers that'll do it, you'll see a, you'll see a chicken house here and a chicken house there and a chicken house there and it might be a lair house, a burler house and a turkey building all within three farms that are touching each other. So if we do get avian flu here, watch out. So biosecurity right now is huge. Those of us that go on farms, we don't go anywhere near the poultry buildings. Uh, we spray our shoes. Uh, we just try to try to make sure that if poultry, poultry get infected that we're not the ones that cause an economic downturn because of avian flu outbreak. So it's kind of got us scared there. The, all the forecasters say any day uh, that avian flu could hit. And if it hits, it's going to be devastating to the economy as well as to our, our producers. So do, do the same, <coughs> I'm, I'm also curious about uh, GMO crops, is that a big deal in, in, in Lebanon County? I mean, again, I'm amazed by what people will pay. Well, um, on eggs, I've, I've seen a box of eggs labeled range-free eggs, and I thought, how in the world do they even get those eggs? I mean, I, I don't know what they do to have a range for free eggs. But, yeah. Free but, range. They give, them the, free range they give them the opportunity to go outside. So it's a confinement house, and it has little doors. And they have the chance to go outside if they want. But if you're in a controlled environment inside, and that's where your feed is, and that's where your water is, and that's where your happiness is, with tunnel ventilation and everything else, are you going to go outside? 
where there's a hawk circling around? So a few of them go out. The the the, the free range is the, uh, some of the more uh, accurate ones. They have little uh, shelters with wire uh, ceilings out over a you know there's a little shelter and there's a, a fence around it with a fence with a ceiling over it or a wire over that so the hawks don't get them and then they move it to different spots. Yeah, the those aren't the ones in the store. Those might be the ones that at the the stand yeah <clears throat> and those are true free range games and, and, and there's always been a place for niche production like that and i i support those guys that do that but what it got it gets difficult is when you have government regulations and or the mcdonald's saying we're only going to accept cage free eggs all of a sudden it, it's such a such a big uh impact on the industry trying to supply an outlet like McDonald's with with cage free or whatever standard they currently have, and it's a moving target as is some government regulations. You know what what Jim's lending money for to build a house today might be no longer qualified for production in three years or around. I mean, a little quick, but five years. That yeah, it's we we, we society should be more concentrated in bringing inefficiencies out of the system than, than supporting the perceived welfare of animals. I, I, I am totally opposed to torturing or cruelty to animals. But it has been, it, it, it comes down to the fundamental view that, uh, in, my, in my opinion, this is personal, that animals and humans are created in the same plane we have you know, we extend the same rights to animals as we do to other humans, and you know, I guess that's basically a worldview difference. And in, 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 in if you believe animals are here for our use, or we're here to serve the animals. But in terms of the GMO question, <coughs> GMO is is a hot spot right now, and it's just a hot button. And if if McDonald's decides they don't want any genetically modified, I mean, most things are genetically modified either through selective breeding well, well, or Every, everything is. So, yeah. so it just so it's it's it, a it mystifies me definition. that people can be. But even Bell and Evans, Scott's talking about going uh, with just GMO-free corn through just because he sells a lot through Whole Foods and and that customer base. We'll pay eight dollars a pound for a chicken breast that's sitting next to one at dollar eighty-five because it's perceived as a healthier piece of meat, and it may be to some extent, but maybe not eight times. So, yeah, that whole argument is you know we had BST in dairy cattle. BST was the synthetic uh, growth hormone. Bovine growth, naturally occurring, synthetic. They, they gave it to cows, they produced more milk because they had a better appetite. Because there's, a, there's too much milk around, in my opinion, there's been a push to market non-BST milk. Well, now the co-ops have come to the producers and said, as of this date, we will no longer accept milk from treated cows with synthetic growth hormone. They were paying them 30 some cents to not use it. Now they're basically saying don't use it. And so there's a lot of producers that used it as a tool that now you know, bought farms at $15,000 an acre and need every ounce of production they can get to pay for it. And the people don't realize that. They want to drive by and see this beautiful farm that the guy is busting his back and it's just that whole education thing that, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not a big fan of giving a cow a shot every 14 days, but uh, it was labeled to use, and the co-ops had made the decision that because of the consumer, you no longer can use this management pool. It's like telling you you can't use electronic filing at the courthouse because we want you to walk there because it's healthier. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it seems to me the con the consumer is 
is not well educated. No, and that's, or they, that's or, why this group. Or they, 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 they fall for things which I, I don't think the marketers put out. I think it's, it's the political groups that put it out. And then the marketers say, hey, we can make a buck in this. Let's push that. And then the, and the public gets sucked up by it and doesn't understand what. Yeah, the internet's, a, the internet's a great thing, but it's a terrible thing because it's instant information and you can Google anything. So there's a lot of these videos around that may or may not be accurate. People think they're true. And I spend a good deal of my time, even away from work, educating people. And I'm sure, Curtis, you're the same way. You run into people and they ask you a question, just like you're doing, and you're like, wow, people just don't know. They have no idea. I mean, when, when I sell grass-fed beef, people call and say, we want steaks. Well, no, there isn't just steaks in a quarter. You know, you get the whole thing. And then they want, you know, they're just so naive to where this meat comes from. They want to, they want all the best cuts, and it's got to come from that quarter. You know, and you, they say, we want a lot of flank steaks, because we like flank steaks. Well, there's only two flanks on an animal, so. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I, I, I think the consumer has a lot of confidence in, in a friend that's a food junkie compared to you know a research from a land grant university. They, they, if, if, if my friend is a foodie says that GMOs cause autism, even if it's not true, we're gonna we're, we don't want to take that risk. You know, it's, there's an unknown out there that we can't explain. So if, if it's possibly true, we don't want to take that risk. And it, it, it's an uphill battle to educate well, against Well, that. even with, with uh, state universities, some, sometimes people who do research get, get grants from, from uh, uh, right. food companies. And so people assume their, their research is tainted just because it was, the grant was provided by a food company. And I mean, I don't know why, uh, if you get your if you get your money from the government, you know, I've never heard a person say that a, uh, a, a grant provided with the government is changing, even though it may be right. that the, uh, you should think that that's biased in favor of whatever the government regulation is or whatever the party in power wants to do. I've never heard anybody say that. It's, it's as though people who are in business taint things, but government doesn't taint things, which I, I find hard to... Comprehend. Yeah, the other thing that we're battling is our generation is the last generation that's probably off the farm for the most part. So the majority of the voting public is not from a farm background. Mm -hmm. So you're just not going to get. I'm sure that makes a difference. It's like both, both my parents were raised on farm and. and through that, I have some you have some, tie. some some agnostic. So this is the last generation of having a direct tie, and and it's really sad because that's why the the small you know know your know your food know your producer kind of that's that's pushing you know there's some very successful businessmen that are that are taking advantage of that because there's but it's more in affluent areas you know you go. Know your food, know your farmer. You get out in Chester County where there's a flush of cash. Down in some parts of Lancaster County, people drive to get there to get this food and pay more for it because they want to know where it comes from. And there, there's a little bit of a movement there, but it all comes with, with a cost. Right. And, and, you know, again, that niche, you can support that, and if people want to pay that, but to have it be imposed from the top down, it's ultimately the poorest in the society are going to suffer because, you know, egg is a, eggs are a building block of any, any diet, any milk also, and if they get too expensive because of regulations that are being forced upon us, the poorest people are the ones that are going to find even basic food items going to put upward price pressure in them and if people have the resources to go drive the country and buy eggs that were produced under 
certain standard. Uh, I love the freedom of choice. So go do it, but don't force us to produce that way. But it seems like like, like public often doesn't understand that more government regulation necessarily causes prices to go up. They, they don't make the connection. Right. right. And people in the farm community probably are, I don't know how many of them are, this scandal with Volkswagen and its testing, people in the farm community that are exposed to organic production, we have been laughing at it quite a while because people buy food that's organic, but the closer you get to organic production, they have all sorts of ways they can still call it organic, but bypass organic requirements in the event of emergency. And we, we, don't, I don't. Know. When you're in the farm community, you hear about people that, oh, that was organic, but oh, maybe uh, they ran out of organic that day, and all of a sudden the conventional became organic because the animals had to be fed. Well, you're allowed to do it on an emergency basis. And, I mean, and I have a couple of anecdotal stories. I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus, but their, their organic is really a joke, much like Volkswagen. They were achieving their efficiencies and mission standards on the official test. In reality, they were you know, making a, uh, a car that was functioning far, well, not far above, but above the standards, they said. And same thing's happening in organic, in my opinion. And, I mean, it's like, like with that, it, it depends what your point of view is, because I, I have a friend who has one of those VWs who passed the test, and he, he, he doesn't want to get his fixed because his gas mileage is great, or his diesel mileage is, is great. So, so if he gets it fixed, his mileage goes down. He's like, why do I want to do that? Right. And, and for the people that aren't in love with government, they, 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 they're supporting VW for sticking his nose sticking a thumb in EPA and beating EPA at their own game, but that's another point of view, too. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, th th thanks very much. I, I mean, I, I find, I'm, I'm sorry we didn't get more people here, but...